The fact that the crew has seen their spacecraft now, uh, this is another major step of us going back to the moon. Remember, uh, we're going back to the moon. It's actually a different moon. We're going to the South Pole. Uh, we're going to see um, several spacecraft, uh, some too, perhaps, from other nations that are going to be landing on the South Pole in the near future, perhaps this year. So there's a renewed interest in the moon. And of course, it's, it's there because the potential of water. And if there is water in enough uh, abundance, then you have the potential for hydrogen and oxygen which would fit in very nicely with why we're going back to the moon this time after a half century. We're going back to learn to live in a deep space environment for long periods of time so that we can go to Mars and return safely. Uh, now, along the way, there are going to be several scientific uh, excitements, uh, the development of new tools, the development of, of new implements, the, the development of new procedures, all of which it's in this Moon to Mars program. And that's the goal. We're going to venture out into the cosmos. We go back to the Moon this time in a different way. We go back with commercial partners. And we go back to the moon with international partners. Uh, you should have seen the reaction when uh, Reed brought the crew to Ottawa uh, and they were in front of the parliament. Or you should have seen uh, Jeremy in his 10-gallon hat at the largest rodeo in the world in Calgary, Alberta. Uh, there's an excitement there that I can tell you that's quite exceptional. As an international mission, you should see the fact that moi, having just returned from South America, three uh, countries, uh, Brazil, Argentina, and uh, Colombia, no hesitation about the president of those countries receiving our NASA delegation. And not only excitement, but enthusiasm of presidents that amazed our U.S. State Department uh, embassy staffs that would accompany us. Uh, there is this excitement in the international community. And of course, all along in the science that we're going to discover things just like I say about the James Webb Space Telescope, uh, we're going to answer questions that we don't even know what the questions are right now. But I remember back... Uh, on the 60th anniversary, they had uh, me go to Houston 60 years to the day, and Rice University was having this celebration. Uh, and it was in the same place that President Kennedy uh, spoke to an audience in that Rice Stadium. This was, uh, you know, a long time ago, but he said, he had already declared in a, in a speech to the joint session of Congress about a year earlier. In the meantime, John Glenn had flown, so we knew we were on our way. And Kennedy went there and he said, we go to the moon not because it's easy, but because it's hard. And space is hard. And there are those discoveries in overcoming this very hard environment that are going to fill us and our nature as discoverers 
and as adventurers. And that's why we're going back to the moon and then on to Mars. It is really a thrill for Bill, Bob, and I to be here with the Artemis II crew to see their heart flight hardware. I think it um, brings back happy memories for the three of us of seeing our flight hardware, but also a shiver down our spine as we step forward into the next chapter of our destiny in human spaceflight. So we are going to stay, as the administrator said, that's very important, and we have the hardware, not just for Artemis II, but for flights all the way out through Artemis VI already in work. And that's, that's very significant. We have been spending a lot of time the last couple of years to really focus on what are the objectives that we need to prove on the moon? What exactly do we need to learn before we're ready to go to Mars? And this is a crucial first step along that way. One of our North Stars is science. That's why we explore to learn more about the universe, our solar system, our Earth, our, ourselves. And there will be some exciting uh, experiments on Artemis II, mostly focused on radiation and crew, because we now have the opportunity to have a crew that we have to have to advance this particular kind of science. But I do want to say for a moment, personally, as a test uh, pilot, how important this mission is at, for test flight. All the things that we want to do with this vehicle, we have to understand that vehicle and its capabilities and push its envelope in order to achieve all the things that we hope to do with it in the future. So that is the critical focus of this mission, is to do that test flight, to push the boundaries, to learn about this vehicle and its capabilities so that we can continue to do amazing things on the surface of the moon and then eventually on Mars. And this is the beginning of that cadence and we're excited to be here today to see us off on that first chapter. We recently, towards the end of July, completed our post-flight assessment review from Artemis I. Uh, that's where we go through all the mission objectives, look at open items and anomalies, and try and decide if we're on the right path uh, for uh, Artemis II. We looked at uh, a number of things that have been open, the heat shield, uh, an electronics box on the service module, and uh, some of the release and retention bolts, uh, probably the highlight things. I think we have plans forward with all of those. We, we still have to get to, to, to root cause before we get to flight rationale. So to Bob's point about safety, uh, that's one of the things we need, uh, we need to get through. Um, as far as overall, we're still working towards the end of November for uh, 24 for Artemis uh, II. That's uh, critical to stay on that path. It's this balance of pushing hard, but maintaining the right philosophy of not pushing too hard, if that makes sense to you. Uh, but uh, I think to us up here, it does. Because we still need to, to press and get our missions on a, on a cadence where we're doing the exploration around the moon and on the surface. This is a great first step for us, um, but we do need to be vigilant and, uh, and care about the people. Uh, going on these missions. Uh, we do have a number of uh, weeks of risk to that date. Uh, the crew module is the uh, critical path right now. We have to uh, get the crew module assembled and tested and then made it with the service module, then turn it over to the ground system folks here uh, for processing. Uh, the exploration ground systems team here uh, continues to push towards a mid-November roll of the mobile launch uh, tower out to the pad to do some verification and validation tests of all the systems that have been upgraded um, and repaired since Artemis 1. Um, and they're, they're on a good path to the 16th. They completed a couple weeks ago the repair of the cable that holds up the uh, crew access arm. Um, so that was a big, uh, uh, a big change. We were originally going to roll out on the first, but that was a, uh, one re uh, repair, repair we had to make. Um, Orion, I talked about the crew module already. Um, I'm sure it was great to see inside that for, uh, for the crew. Uh, the service module was handed over from our European uh, service, uh, uh, service module partners in the European Space Agency in, in June. Uh, we're con continuing to work on the heat shield. We'll probably uh, look for final disposition of that uh, early, uh, early next year. Uh, the space launch system, all the hardware is here right now except the core stage. Uh, we're holding the core stage back in, uh, in Louisiana for some, uh, uh, some repairs that we need to, to make to one of the downcomers. And uh, that'll probably be shipped in the November time frame. There's no impact to the uh, overall critical path or anything for, uh, for stacking, which will probably start in the February time frame of next year. 
Uh, from a flight ops perspective, obviously the crew training is, uh, is, is well underway. The landing and recovery team, which is part of the ground system group here at Kennedy, uh, did the underway recovery test uh, number 10 last week, which included a night recovery. And I know the crew got to see uh, the team in San Diego before they, they uh, put to sea. Um, you know, I, we're, we're really not working major issues right now. We have some of the dispositions I talked about, but I think we're on a, a good path. And I, I want to stress that vigilance piece. Um, I tell everybody, and I think I sat here at this table and said Artemis 1 was a great mission. We learned so much from it. The success was incredible. The only thing that carries over from that mission is the engineering. Uh, we're using all new hardware. So that vigilance of putting that hardware together and calling out when things are not right or there's a concern is really important because these four folks uh, next to me here depend on us to do that. So that'll be a focus of the team and look forward to talking to you as we head closer to Artemis too. It's, it's a great day yesterday when you walk around the corner at the Neil Armstrong Operations and Checkout Facility and there's your spacecraft that you're going to ride in. Uh, the ship, as they call it, over there. And uh, we, got, we got to look inside and hang out, and it was really quite fascinating. Uh, we've been busy since April 3rd. It, it kind of started uh, with a, a bit of a media blitz, but then we got down to work. We've been studying spacecraft systems at the Johnson Space Center. Um, we have gone out to Denver to visit with the Lockheed facilities out there and meet the engineers that are working on the vehicle uh, from the software controls and displays. Uh, as Jim said, we were out in San Diego working with uh, our beloved United States Navy uh, and the rescue and recovery forces that are working alongside NASA. Um, and now here we are uh, for our first visit as a crew to Kennedy Space Center. Uh, I think I want to touch on just two quick things. Uh, first, uh, we get asked often what the measure of success for Artemis II is. And to the four of us sitting here, the measure of success for Artemis II is seeing our colleagues on the lunar surface, seeing our colleagues assembling Gateway, and then seeing people that are following in our footsteps, walking on Mars and coming back to planet Earth. Like that is the measure of success for us. Uh, Artemis II is the tiniest footnote in the Artemis campaign, and that is really what we believe. And, and every day that we go to work, we're, we're looking at this vehicle for the future. We're not looking at this vehicle for Artemis II, and that means a lot to us. Um, the other thing that I wanted to say, because it's really struck us, is we, we hear about the hardware, and, and it's real. You, most of you saw it this afternoon with the spacecraft. Um, those that have been to Mashoud have seen the booster. Uh, you know, out in Utah, our, our solid rocket booster segments are getting ready to be shipped down here for stacking. But as we go around and see the hardware, the thing that blows us away is the quality and the youthfulness of the people that are working on this program, these Americans, these Europeans, our Canadian allies to the north, when you get in these small rooms of 15 to 20 people and you see not only how hard they're working, but how motivated they are, how excited they are to be a part of this every single day, I wish every American, every Canadian, every European, everyone that's a part of Artemis, I wish they could just go see what we get to see, the quality of these people. It is totally awesome.